Amen. So 1 Samuel chapter 4, uh, the Bible reads in verse 1, And the word of the Lord, excuse me, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Aphek. So one thing to notice right out of the gate is the fact that this is a battle that's taking place right in their backyard. This is in the tribe of Ephraim. This isn't them going into their land. This is a, a battle that they're fighting against the Philistines right there in their backyard, you know, amongst the land that God had given them to inherit. And Israel also here we see is going to war of their own accord. You don't read anywhere where the Lord tells them to go fight this battle or says to go out against the Philistines. And that's not to say it didn't happen, but it's not explicitly there in Scripture. The Lord doesn't seem to sanction this war. And you kind of wonder, well, why did they go? Then why are they out there fighting this battle if this isn't something that God uh, necessarily had them to do at this time? You know, and perhaps it's because of the fact that they're emboldened by the Lord appearing again in Shiloh. If you recall last week, the Bible, the chapter 3 ended by them saying, the word of the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for he revealed himself unto Samuel. And, and it was known in all Israel that you know, Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. So, of course, we talked about the fact last week that they ended on a very positive note. You know, it was kind of a hopeless situation. We saw how spiritually dark things had gotten, and they had this, you know, this kind of figurative ray of light. You know, this, they're given this uh, reviving that's about to take place through the prophet Samuel, through the high priest there, the man that was going to be established in the Lord. So maybe that's probably why they're maybe a little bit more bold to go out and fight the Philistines and start to try to you know, deliver themselves from the oppressor in their land. Because uh, you know, it does say there in verse 1, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Right? Now, I don't know if those words that came from Samuel were necessarily included the instructions to rise up and go and fight the Philistines. I don't think that's what was being said. But the word of God was being preached. That's being uh, the point. Now it says here in verse 2, it says, And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. When they had joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. So they're losing this fight. You know, and typically when God is fighting for you, you win, right? And of course, we could think of other instances in Scripture where God did tell them to go fight. Like we think about in the end of Judges where God sent Israel. Uh, they came up against the tribe of Benjamin to deliver, had told them to deliver them, the sons of Belial, the Sodomites, to them. And they refused, and they, you know, civil war broke out. And if you recall in that story, Israel lost, you know, a couple times. I think it was the third time they finally went back, and God was with them and, and, and helped them win that fight. And there's other instances where we saw Israel lose. But I believe, generally speaking, if God's fighting for you, you win, you know. So the fact that they're losing this battle should give them pause, should make them stop and think, well, what's going on here? And uh, that's what it kind of, what, what actually what takes place here in verse 3. Well, let's continue on. It says they were smitten, verse, uh, in verse 2, before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? So <laughs> it's kind of a, a funny question that's asked there. You know, we, we read this person, they, they come in and the elders say, you know, why, why, why were we smitten uh, today before the Philistines? Why, you know, why has the Lord smitten us? You know, why is it that he wasn't on our side? Why didn't God deliver us? And you read, I read that and I have to think to myself, like, really? <laughs> you have to ask that? Do you, do you not understand why God's not on your side? And they're not, they're having a hard time coming to terms with the fact that God is judging their country, okay? And this is something that we as individuals and nations as a whole need to accept, is that God judges and that when he judges, to not sit there and scratch your head and wonder why. You know, God doesn't just indiscriminately judge a nation. And Israel failed, you know, the reason why they're being judged here is because they failed to follow through on God's commandments that were given to them, uh, you know, to destroy, specifically to go in and destroy the Canaanites. If you would, keep something there. Go back to Judges chapter 2. If you recall, when we went through Deuteronomy. They were commanded to go in there and to wipe out all the nations, including the Philistines. All the Canaanites were to be wiped out. Deuteronomy 7, it says, And Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. So God was going to help them with this fight. That thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beast of the field increase upon thee. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, 
and shall destroy them with the mighty destruction until they be destroyed. So God was even going to help them go in there and destroy these people. It said in Joshua 17, Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxen strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. Now, where they were told explicitly to drive them out. In fact, God said, I'll even help you do it. He said, you go in there, obey me. I'll drive them out little by little, and you'll take over this land completely. That You'll leave none of them. But what happened when they got in there? What happened when they began to wax, and st wax strong? When they started to take over that land and get established there, they, did, they put them to tribute. They said, well, we're more interested in their money. They did not utterly drive them out. So they fell short on their, their part of the bargain, didn't they? Did they, they did not follow through on God's commandment to destroy the Philistines. <coughs> and as a result, God, you know, backed out of his part. And he said, okay, uh, you know, then the deal's changed. And he changes the deal and he actually starts to use them, the Philistines and the Canaanites and others, to actually prove and to judge Israel, which is what you see in Judges chapter 2. And if you remember, Judges is the lead up to what, where we are in 1 Samuel. It says in Judges chapter 2, verse 19, And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down. So this was that cycle that we just kept seeing over and over in the book of Judges, leading up to the time when, when Samuel came on the scene, that they, they would disobey God, they'd worship false gods, God would begin to chasten them and judge them and oppress them using the inhabitants of the land, the Philistines and others, then they would, they would repent, you know, and they would get right with God. God would send them a judge. They would deliver them. And then they'd be, everything would be okay for a little while. And then they're right back to their old ways again. You know, uh, disobeying God and God would have to judge them again. It was just this continual cycle. So that's who you're dealing with in 1 Samuel. That's who, uh, that's the type of people that 1 Samuel is being raised up to lead. Okay, there's people that have just been generation after generation just in this perpetual cycle of, being backslidden and getting right, being backslidden and getting right over and over again. <laughs> and it came to pass, of course, we read that verse 20, uh, that they bowed down, verse 20, excuse me, and it says, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and not hearken unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. He said, Look, they're going to disobey me and not keep my commandments. They're going to upset me and they're going to you know, transgress my covenant. He says, I'm not going to help them out. Then you know what? I'm not going to drive out those nations. Those nations can just stay there then. And it said in verse 22 that I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did or not. Therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So that's why these Philistines are still there in Samuel's day. Because back, you know, because Israel had transgressed God and God just said, okay, well, we'll tell you what, we're just going to leave them there. And now they can just be a thorn in your side all of your days. And I'll actually use them to test you, to see whether or not you're going to follow me. And I'll actually use them to judge you. Look there in chapter 3, verse 1. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many as of Israel had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that generations of the children that of Israel might know to teach them war, at least such as before knew nothing thereof. Th verse 3, namely the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and so on and so forth. And it says in verse 4, and they were uh, to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken to the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded by their fathers, uh, fa their fathers by the hand of Moses. So that's what we see taking place. That's where we're at. That's why these Philistines are parked in their backyard, you know, uh, pressing them. That's why they're having to go and, and battle against them. And that's why God is not fighting for them. It's because they have transgressed his commandments. Now, it was right for Israel to, you know, in the beginning there, when the word of Samuel came to them, it was good for them to be encouraged by that. It was good for them to know that, hey, things have changed. You know, the Samuel is established to be a prophet of the Lord. You know, none of his words are going to fall to the ground. He's going to preach us the word. We're going to learn. That should have emboldened them, right? That, that's, that's the natural reaction. But it should have emboldened them to get right with God. Not to just like, hey, God's on, just assume, oh, God must be on our side. Now we got a prophet. Now we've got a preacher. Now we got a priest. Now it's time for us to just go out and take over the rest of the land and, and kick these Philistines out once and for all. What it should have emboldened them is to get right with God. Maybe stop and take inventory of where they're at spiritually. And maybe do some repenting. 
Maybe do, you know, maybe say, hey, you know, we're sorry, God, and, and, and maybe try to seek the Lord rather than just go fight some war. And now if you would, uh, go back to 1 Samuel, but go to, over to 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7. Because <laughs> in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7, you know, some time has elapsed, okay, from, from chapter 4. And it says in verse 1, And the men of Kirjath-Jerim uh, came and fetched, uh, fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar. Of course, we know from what we just read that they, they took the, the ark of the Lord out, the Philistines took it, and then so on. And so they, then they, <laughs> they tried to send it back. And it was this, it, it, we'll see in upcoming chap uh, chapters. But at this point in the story, you know, Israel is finally getting the ark back. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerim that it was the time, uh, that the time was long, for it was 20 years. So a lot of time has gone by. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Now that's, that's the right attitude. There should have been some lamenting. I mean, you have to again remember, where is Israel at at this point in, in 1 Samuel chapter 3? This is just, we're, we're seeing just, you know, perpetual generations of just getting right, backsliding, getting right, backsliding. God's upset with them. They have not, they have transgressed his covenant and God, the, the, the anger of the Lord has waxed hot against them. And just because God's beginning to give them a little light, you know, doesn't mean necessarily that he's ready to just, you know, deliver them from all these oppressors. Maybe he's looking for a different reaction. And the Bible says the goodness of God leadeth thee to what? To repentance. The goodness of God, it doesn't say leadeth thee to these, these great victories. Now we know God, if, if God before us, none can be against us, right? Who, who then can be against us? But you know, we have, it's more important to be right with God than anything. It's more important to be right with God and then just, you know, you have to make sure of that though. You can't just assume, well, I must be right with God because, you know, there's a preacher. Because, uh, because Samuel's here. You know, now we must, well, the God must be blessing. It must mean everything's good to go. You know, we have to make sure that, that we're right with God, that nations are right with God. And how do they do that? You know, well, maybe, maybe they should have stopped and looked back and said, boy, we've come from a long line of backsliders. Boy, we've really burned God for a long time now. And maybe, maybe God's giving us a little reviving. Maybe God's giving, a little, uh, giving us a little light for us to just humble ourselves and just get right with God. And then we'll talk about the Philistines. And then maybe we'll see about delivering ourselves from these oppressors. <coughs> and it came to pass, it says there, uh, we'll go to verse 3. You know, it says that they had lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake on all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do a return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtoreth from among you. So this is again shows us more of what these people were like. Samuel, you know, he's been there for over 20 years, and he still has to stop and tell them, why don't you put away the strange gods? Why don't you get the sin out of your life? Why don't you get uh, you know, these strange gods out of your life? Put away these strange gods from among you if you do return on the Lord with all your hearts. And that was the reaction they should have had at the very beginning. When they first understood that Samuel had been established to be a prophet of the Lord, that's when they probably said, well, we've got a chance here for God to do something with us and, and maybe it's time for us to just get right with God, take inventory spiritually, get the sin out, put away the strange gods, and just get right with God. Instead of just, you know, being presumptuous, say, oh, well, we got the preacher now, let's just run out there and, all this, and God's for us. Must, obviously, God's not upset with us. When, what, what happened when they did that? You know, they were smitten of their enemies. And a lot of people died. He said there, look, if you return to the Lord your God with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and, and astral from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So that was the part of that equation that they forgot that God was willing to deliver them, that God was willing to you know, deliver them out of the hand of the Philistines, but they still hadn't done their part. You know, they just assumed, oh, Samuel's, Samuel's the man now. God must be just honky-dory, just A-OK -okay with everything we're up to, and took it as a stamp of approval. When they, and then they just left off the fact that they still had all these false gods and all this sin. <coughs> Instead, what they did, and if you would, go back to uh, chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Instead, what they did is they kind of just treat God like a good luck charm. They just take the ark and think, oh, it's just a, it's a lucky rabbit's foot kind of thing. You know, if we rub the ark, you know, well, Uzzah, Uzzah found out about that, right? Don't touch it. But, you know, if we just have the ark with us, then we're good to go, you know? <clears throat> that's what he said there in verse 3. That's why they're so perplexed, right? In verse 3 it says, 
And when the people were come to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? They couldn't figure it out. They're scratching their heads. Why is God judging us? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's because of all your, your sin. Maybe it's all your backsidedness. Maybe it's because of you know, the Ashtaroth and all these false gods. Maybe because you're not really serving God with all your heart. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Just a guess. But instead, they go on and they say, Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Now, what are they trusting? Are they trusting the Lord? Or are they just trusting in God's, this box that God had them made? Now, look, that's, I'm not being, uh, uh, you know, what's the word? Sacrilegious? I don't know. When I say it was just some box God had them make, because that's all it was. It was just a picture of the things that are in heaven. Look, there was nothing in and of. Well, which, what is greater, the, 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 the ark or, the, or the, gold, uh, the gold or the ark, that the God that sanctified the gold, Jesus said. <coughs> it's the God of Israel that made them great, not this box that they had, the ark. But that's what they're trusting in. They're saying, look, let's just, well, let's, obviously, you know, we're being smitten because we don't have the ark with us. We know it couldn't possibly be us. We know it possibly could. Is it, the, oh, is it this false god, Ashtaroth, I have over here? No, that's not it. No, it's because I don't have the ark. Let's just add God to our sinful ways and see, and then obviously everything will be okay. <clears throat> that's what they say there. When it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of their enemies. There, no reference to the Lord. No, not, not, maybe let's, let's get right with God and then the Lord will be with us and the Lord will deliver us and save us out of the hand of our enemies. <laughs> so the people went to Shiloh that they may bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts which dwelleth between the cherubims and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. So they're real excited about what's going on. You know, they're real excited about the fact they got the ark with them now. <coughs> and they're just convinced that this is it. This was the problem. We just didn't have the ark with us. You know, they didn't have their good luck charm with them to, to, to see them through this battle. I mean, do you see how they're treating this thing? Like, like there's something in and of the ark itself that's going to save them. No. It's, it's the ark of the Lord that dwelleth between the cherubims. And it's, it, he's the one that matters. <coughs> and... Uh, they get all excited and they, they shout with a great shout so the earth rang. You know, so, you know, how can we apply that to today? And if you would, go over to Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35. You know, we as a nation are kind of in a similar situation. I mean, we're a nation that has uh, known the Lord. You know, we've had at least, maybe not necessarily independent fundamental Baptist heritage, but we definitely have a very Christian heritage in this nation. There's no denying that. That our founders and the people that came over here, the early settlers and the people that you know, first uh, grew this nation into what it is, were godly, God-fearing people by and large. You know, even, if, even the unsaved, even those that didn't understand the truth of the gospel were still you know, respected the, the word of God, tried to live by the word of God, so on and so forth. We have a lot of Christian heritage in this nation, don't we? Kind of like the children of Israel. I mean, they were a people that knew the Lord, that knew of the God of Israel, that were familiar with His ways and what was expected. But they got away from God, much like our nation today. Our nation today has gotten away from the Lord. And look, I don't think I have to sit here and make an argument for that. I think everybody in this room gets that. I mean, do I really have to go on and on to try and convince you of that this night? Because here's the thing. I mean, we don't have to look very far to see that. When God's been kicked out of every public square in this country where he's not welcome in the schools, he's not welcome in the courts, he's not welcome in our government, uh, people that, you know, the, the, the Christians in this nation are mocked and ridiculed and looked down upon and scoffed at. There's no respect for the Bible. You know, they used to, you know, it, it, you know sometimes you go out sewing and knock on someone's door and they're at least, they're, they don't want to hear it, but they're, they're polite and you can appreciate that. But then more and more you start running to people who just want to laugh at you and, oh, just some Bible thumper. You just start calling your names and whatever. I mean, it's, duck, it's water off a duck's back. It doesn't really bother me. I just, I feel sorry for that person. But it shows you where we're get going as a nation, where there's no respect for the things of God. 
I mean, do we really have to start talking about the culture, all the ungodliness that's in the mu movies and the music and all forms of entertainment that are out there, just how wicked this nation has become as a whole? <clears throat> I mean, I'm telling you, this, this, wish, this nation is wicked tonight, folks. We live in the midst of an adulterous and perverse nation, a crooked generation. That's what we're living in right now. It's wicked. And you know what? There might have been a time when we knew the Lord where this nation tried to honor the things of God, but that's, that's in our past. And I'll say this, it's never coming back. It's never going to come back. That's my belief. You can disagree with me, but that's my opinion. There's no bringing this country back from the edge. I mean, all we can do right now is just like a flood. It's just like a, just a, a flood going over an edge. Just a huge waterfall. Like, there's no stopping. All we can do is just stop and try and pull some people out before they go over and get a few here and there. But, and we try to stem that, that, that flood, but I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's coming. This, this country uh, is going down the tubes fast. And, you know, it's kind of like Israel here. They get, they get the ark, you know, and they, have, they shout, and everybody's happy. And they're just so convinced that that's all they needed to do is just, you know, pay some lip service to God and get their, their ark and everyone get excited and, and victory's secure, right? No, it's not. We'll see that here in a minute. And it's kind of like that for our nation today. You know, you know it's going to take a lot more to save this nation than a day of prayer. You know, it's going to take a lot more than a, a national, you know, prayer, day of prayer or a prayer breakfast. It's going to take a lot more to save this nation than just writing, in God we trust, in the back of the dollar bill. You know, right alongside your Illuminati pyramid, <laughs> the Eye of Horus, and all your other junk that's on there. It's going to take a lot more than that, than, you know, some big parade where we just pay lip service to God. Like they're doing here. It's going to take a lot more than that to save this ungodly nation. Than just this, you know, this just this fake spirituality that they're putting out there. But it looked there. In fact, there's no saving this nation. That's my opinion, and I believe I'm right about that because of Scripture. Look at Numbers 35, verse 33. It says, "So, oh, ye shall not pollute the land where uh, wherein ye are." God's saying, "Look, don't pollute the land." Now, is he talking about don't go pour motor oil in the in the storm sewer tonight? Don't pollute the land, folks. Recycle. Reduce, reuse. Is that what God's promoting? What is it in God's eye that pollutes the land? And by the way, I'm not one of these ones that's just like, we should be good stewards of the earth. You know, I grew up, I was told to recycle, and we, we recycle to this day just out of habit. You know, I don't know. I don't, I don't litter. I think we shouldn't litter and things like that. Because some Christians get this idea, oh, it's all God's going to burn it anyway, so let's just make a mess of things and just... You know, let's just pollute the groundwater and the air while we're at it. Like, that's probably not a good idea. You dwell there, right? But in God's eyes, what really defiles the land? I mean, what if we were right with God? And we, and we, then, you know what? We could go out and just, you know, pour motor oil and spray aerosol and just throw our trash everywhere and still be blessed. Because in God's eyes, those aren't the things that pollute a land. What pollutes a land is blood, innocent blood. It says there, uh, ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are, for blood it defileth the land. And the land cannot be cleansed of blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. And he's talking about innocent blood being shed. You know, and let me tell you something, this country is just dripping with innocent blood. And you know, you don't have to go very far back in its history. You know, I'm sure there were, you know, our, the wars for our, our, our freedom and things like that. You know, people can debate that, whether that was right or not, whatever. But when you get into the certain parts of the history of this country leading up even to today, there has been a lot of innocent blood that has been shed in this land. Just through war alone. Not even going to the place where we start to talk about abortion, where there's just thousands of babies just being murdered in this country every day. And that's not a pleasant subject, but that's where we're at. That's, that's the country we're living in. A country that is just soaked. The land is just soaked in its in blood. You know, God noticed, one, God noticed just one person back being dead. He heard the, the cry of one person's blood back in, 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 uh, in Adam's day, right? Cain and Abel, when Cain slew Abel, he says, your brother's blood, blood crieth to me from the ground. That was just one guy. Imagine all the cries that God is hearing coming out of the ground in this country today. 
all the human waste, you know, uh, dumpsters full of aborted fetuses that are just crying out today. That, and you think God's just going to ignore that? And look, you can't just say, oh, we're sorry. Well, you know, and even if we stop, even if we stop, all the abortions just ended tomorrow. Just no more. And all the wars and all the other innocent blood that, uh, and all the other ways it shed just stop tomorrow. It still wouldn't be enough. Because God's not just going to be like, all right, well, you knocked it off. That's good. No, you still have to make atonement for all that. Isn't that not what it says? It says the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed, but by the blood of him that shed it. And it's eye for an eye. It's tooth for a tooth. You know, they, 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 and here's the thing. We're, we're not going to be shedding that blood. We're going to shed all the innocent blood as a nation, but we're never going to shed the guilty that have shed that blood. You, know, you see what I'm saying? We're never going to cleanse it because we're never going to shed the blood that needs to be shed in this country. So, so by that, that, having said that, that's what I can say with confidence, we're doomed. <laughs> we are. We're doomed in this country. You know, are you glad you came to church tonight? <laughs> Let me just encourage you tonight that we're doomed, okay? But we are, as a country, okay? <laughs> That's not to say that we as Christians can't live, still live quiet, peaceable, godly lives and do great works for God in the process. That's why Jesus told us to shine as lights, to, 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 to shine as lights in, in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation. To be a city a set upon a hill that, that not put our light under a bushel. You know, it's kind of a cliche saying, but it's true. You know, the darker the world gets, the brighter we can shine. You know, and, and, and here's the thing. When, when, as the judgment starts to come, and believe me, judgment's already coming to this nation. I mean, good light. Take a look at the things that are going on in this country. With, you know, COVID-19 and the riots and the taxes. I'm just all these. It's already here. It's already coming out. That's not to say that, you know, we can't still do great works for God. And as judgment comes, we can. It's just an opportunity for us to be even shine even brighter in the darkness. That's what I'm saying tonight. So don't lose hope. Don't be despondent. But you know what? At the same time, don't be so foolish as these people back in 1 Samuel to think that, you know, well, we got the word of God and we're just good to go. Nothing's going to harm us. Let me just put this on the dash of my car and I won't get in an accident. You know, God's not a good luck charm where you just put in your, your two cents and get something out of it. <clears throat> you know, God wants obedience. God wants to be, uh, his commandments to be obeyed. That's how you get the blessing of God. <clears throat> so it's going to take a lot more to save them here than just an ark. And it's going to take a lot more for this nation. In fact, I think we're, we're, we're even beyond Israel. What the, at least Israel had hope at this point in the story. At least there was a glimmer of hope for them. <coughs> you go over to Psalms 19 and say, well, I don't know about that. I don't know about Brother Corbin. I think you're just kind of going off on a... You just sound like you're on another you know, libertarian rant or something. You know, and I say that not because I'm libertarian, but because, you know, it just sounded good in the moment, I guess. I don't know. You're just blowing off some steam, Brother Corbin. You're just some preacher up there rattling his cage tonight. God's blessing America. Oh, really? How many trillions of dollars are we in debt? Does anyone even know? Probably somebody does. I don't know. Does it matter? When we're so in debt, it's, it's crazy. And, and there's no coming back from it. <coughs> The Bible says, you say, no, no, God's going to, God bless America. You know, God's going to bless us. And, and why? Be because we're America. Just because we're America. Look, this mentality is out there, folks. <laughs> that somehow, you know, we're, we're ex you know, American exceptionalism. That somehow we're just, we know, we, you know, this doesn't, we love this book, but it doesn't really apply to us. <laughs> we love God, but and he's just going to give us a big pass. No, the Bible says all nations, all nations, all nations. What, what part of all don't we understand tonight? All nations before him are as nothing. You say, well, that's pretty degrading. Well, it goes on in Isaiah and he says, they are counted to him less than nothing. I mean, they're in the negative. God looks down and says, America, pff, less than nothing. <clears throat> Look at Psalms 9, 9, Psalms, uh, 9, verse 17. It says in Psalm 9, verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. As this, and I'm telling you, this nation has forgotten God tonight. 
I mean, you would say that about Israel, wouldn't you? Oh, sure, they had the ark. They had the ark with them, but that's all they had. They didn't have the God who told them to build that ark. They didn't have the God whom that ark represented. That's all they had, just some box with some gold on it. That's it. <coughs> they had forgotten the God of Israel. And I'm telling you, we as a nation have forgotten the God of Israel. People don't even want to retain God in their knowledge, God in their knowledge in this country anymore. They want to forget about this book. They want to forget that God even exists. <clears throat> and you know what? It says all nations that forget God are going to be turned into hell. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the expectation of the poor shall not perish. See, why would good why would God do that? So that the poor and the needy would not just con be continually suffering forever? Because that's what nations do. Our nation is an, is an oppressive nation. You, you know, it is. It oppresses its own people. I mean, taxes. I mean, do I... Hello? I feel a little oppressed when somebody's just taking money out of my pocket before, without even asking me. And then telling me, oh, it's voluntary. <laughs> oh, you volunteered to do this? No, I didn't. Yes, you did. <laughs> you volunteered. Didn't you know that? Oh, I forgot how a voluntary system works, you know, where if I don't pay taxes, I end up in a federal prison. I, yeah, let me volunteer, please. I step right forward for that. That's oppression. When people are just taking money from you and spending it on whatever. <coughs> but, you know, that's where we're at as a nation. That's where they were, a nation that has forgotten God. The difference between, uh, you know, they had it better off because at least they had a chance because they hadn't gotten to the point where God is just going to completely judge them. But look there in verse 6, it says, And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, we're back in 1 Samuel chapter 3, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come unto the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come unto the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not the servants unto that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. So it's funny because it seems like the Philistines here they have more of a fear of God than the Hebrews do. I mean, he, the Hebrews are like, let's bring it into the into the camp. You know, let's get the ark. They're not, a, they're not looking for the Lord. They're just looking for their, their good luck charm. But the Philistines, they understand that, that when the ark came in, that they took that as the, that, the God, that God is with them, the God that they had heard about and all the things that he had done to the Philistines. It seems like they have more of a fear of God than Israel does at this point. That's the way it would seem to me when I read this. And Israel, if you look there in verse 8, it says, Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of these mighty hands of these gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. They're recalling all the things that God had done in the past for Israel, right? And I think maybe that's what Israel is doing. Let's just get the ark, because that represents this God, you know, who fought for us in the past. And what they're doing is, is they're just relying on past glory. They're just saying, oh, God's going to fight for us because of our fathers and everything that happened in the past. He did it in the past, he'll do it again. <coughs> and let me just say this, you know, when you apply it, bring it home today, our country's history will not save it from its coming destruction. You know, I've seen people just arguing online, and it's, it's stupid, and I'm not really, I don't want to get into it about, you know, the forefathers and whether they were godly people or not, and no doubt some of them weren't, but some of them were. And people are questioning, you know, should we even be obeying the Constitution? And, and it's, it's crazy. I don't even want to get into it. But I will say this. Our country's history will not save it. You can't, we can't just rely on past glory and say, oh, our forefathers. Oh, the Constitution. It's, it's what's going to save us. Nope, it's not. You know what's going to, not that this country could be saved, in my opinion, but if it could, it would be through the Lord. It'd be through obeying Him. The Bible says in Romans 8, What shall we say unto these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And that's a great promise, isn't it? 
Did you know the inverse is true? If God is not for us, who can be against us? The answer is everybody. And then when you don't have God on your side, you're just as weak as anybody else. You're like Samson when the Spirit of the Lord has gone from you as any other man. Be it as an individual or a nation. And when a nation forgets God and forsakes God and just starts relying on past glory, you know, they, they, are, they are vulnerable to attack. And it says in verse 10, And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. I mean, you, you read what they said there. The Philistines say they're afraid. They're scared. They think this is it. They're like trying to encourage you all. Quit yourselves like men. You know, die on your shield, gentlemen. Don't go out. They think this is it. We're done. <clears throat> but what they don't realize is that God's not with Israel at this point. God's not fighting with them. And they actually end up winning. Israel's going into a, hey, we got this. We got the ark. We're going to win. And they end up just getting wiped out. It says there, and there was a great slaughter for their fellow of Israel, 30,000 footmen. I mean, can you imagine just 30,000 people dying in one day in one war? Just gone. I mean, all the dads and the husbands and the brothers, just gone. Just like that. <clears throat> and the ark of the Lord was taken. And the two sons of Eli and Hophni, Hophni and Phinehas were slain. So well, at least some, some good came of it. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, and, and, and the U.S., you know, our country today, you know, I just keep thinking about our country as I was reading this. And you think about how uh, Israel here, everything that they had done, you know, all their being backslidden and all of their ungodliness and, and you know, how, that's just the poor condition they were in spiritually, how they just left God. And, you know, God judged them for that. Right? They had kindled God's wrath. And the Bible says in Psalms 2, Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. You know, when God just gets the least bit of upset with, with a country, I mean, he's saying, look, you better, you better kiss and make up. You better get right. You better kiss the son. You better put your trust in him. So I read about Israel and, you know, they just suffered this great loss. But then I think about our country. And I think about everything our country has done to kindle God's wrath. And I wonder, have we kindled God's wrath just a little? Or have we kindled God's wrath maybe a little bit more? Maybe we've turned the stove up a little bit you know, beyond just simmer. You know, it's, not, it's, it's beyond boil. You know, it's like flambe. You know, that's not even a setting. But it's just like, it's not even an oven. You know, it's not. Israel is kind of like, you know, they're, it's like they're just a little bit lighter and they're kind of kindling God's wrath. You know, the United States is like a, a weed burner, or like a blowtorch. We're just like, oh, there's God's wrath. Just let's get this thing going. That's what our country's like. <coughs> and Israel, you know, eventually they kind of, they got there to avenge themselves as well. Because all nations shall be turned into hell that forget God. Israel, United States, you name it, anybody. And we've already begun to see judgment in this country. And you just say, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe it's all a coincidence. Everything that's kind of been going on this last year and, and other things, it, it's just all, you know, it's Bill Gates judging us. You know, and it's like it, people need to get this through their head is that God can use Bill Gates to judge this country. You know, oh, the AIDS virus, that's not God's judgment. It's created in a lab. Okay, then God allowed a, like, to be created in a lab to judge us. And God can, you know, use some, okay, uh, coronavirus was created in a lab over in China. I'm not saying that, but it's out there, right? It's, it's just one big scheme, right? Okay, well, it's still the judgment of God. Whether you believe, you know, Bill Gates is doing it or China, you know, the, 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 some providence in China, some lab in China is doing it. God uses ungodly people to judge countries all the time. He yeah, happens all the time. <clears throat> be not deceived, the Bible says, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You know, that goes for us as individuals, but that goes for countries too. And we'd be pretty foolish to sit here and think that this country could just keep on going and, and sowing and sowing and sowing wickedness. Just generation after generation, decade after decade, abortion after abortion, all the smut and filth just getting worse and worse and worse. Decade, just generation after generation, continually going on, sowing, 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 and say, but God's not going to judge us. But we're not going to reap anything because we're the United States. Think again, friend. 
And our job, you say, well, this is a very disheartening sermon. <laughs> well, you know what? Show up Sunday night. Maybe I'll preach something nice. But this is the Bible tonight, okay? And this is where we're at in this country. I'm just telling it like it is. And you say, well, well how does that apply to us? You know, to go home tonight and just, you know, go sit in the corner and wait for it. You know, you might as well just walk out of here with your head hanging your head and just, just brace for impact, people. That's all I got for you, right? No. You know, what is our job then? Is to keep serving God to the best of our ability. <clears throat> the Bible says, you know, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That's Galatians 6. God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Therefore, let us not be weary in well-doing, for we shall reap in due season. You know, this country might be going to hell, but let's go out there and win souls. This country might be going to hell, but let's go ahead and raise some godly children. <clears throat> you know what I love about you know, this chapter and the other chapters coming up where it's just all these terrible things happening to Israel? Is you just don't read about Samuel. You see Samuel running around with his head, like a chicken with a head cut off, just pulling it, oh, what's going to happen? What's going on? You don't see Samuel that. You know, he's not even mentioned again until chapter 7. And we know that, you know, he probably was the high priest pretty quick after that because in the end of this chapter, Eli dies and Samuel takes his place. The sons are dead. Samuel steps right in. He's ready to go. You know, through all the judgment that we're going to read about coming up in the, in the, even in the upcoming chapters, the 20 years that elapse here, Samuel's just serving God. Samuel's in the house of the Lord, keeping the temple, preaching the word, just doing what God told him to do. And meanwhile, <laughs> The country's being judged. People are distraught. You know, he's not mentioned again until chapter 7 after the Lord's just been chastening and judge, judging not only Israel but the Philistines as well. Go over to 1 Samuel chapter 7. I know he had you there. He said, I'll remind us again of what he said in verse 3. Samuel and spake and said unto the house, all the house of Israel, if you do return to the Lord with all your hearts and put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts and serve him only. So this whole time of God's just judging them, they're suffering, the ark is taken, people are dying, 30,000 men are gone, they don't know what to do, they're distraught, they're lamenting. And when they finally come to their senses where they're ready to hear, where they're ready to listen to what the man of God has to say, then he tells them in chapter 7, okay, well now that you're done running around, now that you're sick and tired of, of being chastened by God and you want to return them all your hearts, then you know what? Prepare your hearts and serve Him only. Look, that's, that's us in this story. That's us tonight. We're the Samuels in this story right now in this country. And God's going to judge this country and He's going to punish this country and mark it down. It's going to happen. And when He does, our job is to be there and to be, able, and to be ready to tell people what they need to do when they're finally ready to listen. You know, I, I honestly, I, I said this uh, over, I was saying this before this whole COVID-19 thing happened. I was saying this. I said it audibly out loud to people. I can't remember who. Out soul winning. I'd be in some rich neighborhood, some well-to-do neighborhood, and people just, meh. You know, we were talking about it today. They had that real nice way of being a jerk. Oh, thanks. Thanks for stopping by. Have a great day. So insincere. And they're just not interested. They never want to hear it. They're always busy, whatever. And I remember saying, this country needs an economic downturn. You know, Pastor Anderson came down here and preached a while back. You know, God's wrath is justified. And in that, in that sermon, if you remember, he was talking about the fact that this country could use some judgment. And I agree with that. Because you know what? When God really starts to bring the hammer down and starts to judge this country where people are going to be really at their wits end, you know what they'll start to do? They'll start to listen. And then we'll say, oh, you're ready to listen now. We'll be like Samuel in chapter 7. Well, if you're really, really ready to turn to the Lord with all your heart, you need to forget these false gods and serve God only. Then they'll be really be open to the gospel. You watch how quickly people's attitudes change in some of these neighborhoods when things really start to get rough. You know, that's just a general philosophy or, or way to live your Christian life, too. <laughs> it's just to just be ready to give, uh, to, uh, you know, to give an answer to every man that asketh of the hope that is in you. And wait for God to work in people's lives. Maybe not even as a nation as a whole. 
You know, maybe there's people in our lives that just won't listen to us. They just, they don't want to hear it. And they might even mock it and think it's stupid and, and ridicule us. But if we just stay faithful to God, like Samuel in chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5 and chapter 6, and let them go through in their lives, let them go through their chapter 4 and their chapter 5 and their chapter 6, let them go through the judgment of God and everything else that's going to happen in their life. Let God chasten them and work them over for a while. Our job is just to be there, ready to give them an answer in chapter 7. You know, maybe there's some relative or some friend that doesn't want to hear it from you. Give it time. Stay faithful like Samuel and give it time. And I'm telling you, down the road, it just might be that they'll say, okay, I've had enough of this. What was that you were telling me that one time? Let's go talk to you know, so-and-so. I know he's a Christian. He knows about the Bible. He knows what's going on. Let's go talk to him and see what's, what this is about. And then they'll be ready to hear. That's what I love about the story, is that you have all these bad things happening, but you have Samuel who's just, just sitting back going, all right, well, I'll just keep doing my thing. I'll just keep serving God. And eventually they'll come around. And when they do, I'll tell them exactly what it is they need to hear. You know, Samuel, he spends all his time just serving God and just waiting until Israel is ready to listen. And the point of the sermon, you know, what I'm going tonight is, is, is to not get discouraged by the, the, the message of judgment. Because, and, uh, but here's the thing, I would be dishonest to get up here and say, oh, everything's fine. God's not going to judge us. Look, God's going to judge this country. And we're stuck in it. <laughs> and we're going to be here for it. Our job is just to keep serving God and people will listen. Be ready to give an answer. Okay? <clears throat> you know, the people that, the only people that take the judgment poorly are the backslidden. The people that aren't right with God. You know, all the people that are just worried and pulling their hair out and biting their nails, are the, they're the people that aren't right with God. That's who, that's who can't handle this when God starts to judge. They sit around and they worry about their money. They're, they're, just, they're just fretting about, you know, what's going to happen. It's because they're backslidden. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 12. And there ran a man out of the army, a man of Benjamin, excuse me. So he got it in Israel, right? He's coming out of the army. He was there in the battle. He was one of these guys. Ah, oh, we got the ark. We're going to go fight. Oh, and then just, pfft, everyone's dead. <laughs> they go running back. And what's he do? He comes to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. You know, he's like, he's afflicting himself. You know, that would have been the thing to do in, in end of chapter 2 when God has established Daniel to be a prophet of the Lord. That would have been the time to say, oh, God's giving us a second chance. Let's, let's show God some repentance. Not after God has judged us. And he's the one that's taking it poorly, right? This guy that's just, oh, you know, you know, afflicting himself. He's, he's the backslidden guy in the story. That's who he represents. Look, backslidden people are the ones that can't handle when God's judgment starts to strike close to home because they're the ones being judged. Look, if we're right with God, all this could just burn down around us and we'd be fine. Just like Elijah, right? After he slew, slew the prophets of Baal and Jezebel has come to take his head, God said, hey, go to the brook. Go to the river. I'll feed you there. I'll protect you. God protects his people all the time. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the midst of the fir fiery furnace, right? I mean, they're in a furnace. They got thrown in there by the king. They come out unscathed. <clears throat> Backslidden don't, people don't have that faith. Backslidden people just sit around and worry. They, pour, they, they tear their clothes and pour dirt on their head and, and, and cry about it. <clears throat> and they, you know, it would have been better for him, this guy to actually afflict himself in the beginning and then maybe God would have given him the faith. But look there in verse 13, he says, And when he came to Eli, and when he came, lo, Eli sat on, upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And I love that it says he trembled for the, heart, for the ark of God. He wasn't worried about his sons. We'll get into that here in a minute. And when the men came into the city and told it, all the city cried out, Oh, God's judging us. Ah! What did you expect, Israel? What did you expect was going to happen? 
when you're worshiping false gods, when you're transgressing his commandments, when you're just constantly getting backslidden, never getting right with God, never staying right with God, what do you think was going to happen? They're backslidden. They're the ones that are losing it. And Eli heard the noise of the crying, and he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the men came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could, not, uh, he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. And there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. So he just got a lot of bad news, right? It was just like one thing after another. I mean, bad things come in threes, they say, right? There's been a great slaughter. Thy sons are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, he fell off from the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he judged Israel 40 years. So what kills him? Is it the news about the people? Nope. Is it the news about his sons? Uh-uh. It's the news of the Ark of God. That's really what he did Eli, Eli in. You know, and you know, again, and I'm not trying to just you know, make this, as we go through this book, trying to be the guy that sticks up for Eli, because Eli had a lot of shortcomings. But there's also some things I think we, we kind of bag on Eli over, it, but it, rightly so. But sometimes we don't really stop and kind of maybe give him a little bit of credit where it's due. I mean, there's, he wasn't the greatest guy, but what was it that really got to Eli? What smote his heart in this story? What was it that just, oh, literally knocked him over what was it it was the ark you know he still had i believe i believe eli had a heart for god i mean i already mentioned it did he not raise samuel at least he raised samuel i mean somebody was raising that boy and it was eli you got to give him some credit <coughs> so he falls back and he breaks his neck and you know what that shows us is that the death of the wicked should not trouble us. You know, that's the thing I want to focus in on here at the end is that he hears the son. I mean, imagine if I came to you and said, hey, your sons are dead. That's like the worst news any parent could ever receive. That's the worst fear any parent has. You know, generally speaking, I believe that. You know, any parent that has a heart for their kids, they would rather die than their children. But here you have Eli being told both your sons are dead. They just died. But it's the, it's the news about the ark that, ugh, you know, causes him to fall down and die, break his neck. <clears throat> and you know, I think that's because Eli knew what his sons were. Now, I'm sure it broke his heart that they were what they were and had become what they become and so on and so forth. But the point I want to make here is that the death of the wicked should not trouble us. You don't see Eli going, oh, my sons, and freaking out and dying because of that. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't, he didn't just take it, <laughs> it was probably still bothered him. But look, the death of the wicked should not trouble us. The Bible says, when it goeth well, go over to Psalms 58. Psalms 58, it says in Proverbs 11, when it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. But when the wicked perish, there is shouting. When the wicked perish, there is shouting. Not shouting like, like wailing. But shouting like, shouting for joy. Look, we should shout for joy when the wicked perish. We should. We should shout for it. That the wicked will cease from oppressing. That wickedness is being done away. Look, everyone that, that is punished by God deserves it. Everyone that's punished by God deserves it. Or God's unjust. Right? Right? So when God's punishing the wicked, when we see the wicked be punished, there is shouting. That's something to get excited about. <clears throat> Look, if God's going to come judge this wicked nation, I'm going to shout about it. It's going to put a smile on my face. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to sit there and, and bemoan it and be all boo-hoo and, and go sulk in a corner. In fact, I, to some degree, I kind of want it. Come Lord Jesus, let's get this thing going. Let's do it. Let's, let's take these proud people down a few notches and make them realize that they're but men, just like everybody else, and maybe they'll get saved. Maybe they'll actually listen to what we have to say. Look, when the wicked, are pun when the wicked perish, there is shouting. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but the wicked beareth real, rule the, the people mourn. Well, do you want to shout or do you want to mourn in this country? Well, it's a matter of do you want to 
do you want the wicked to rule or do you want the righteous to rule? And look, you can't, they can't both rule. It's got to be one or the other. So if the wicked perishing means that the righteous are going to rule, I'm all for it. Amen. And I'm going to shout about it. And I'm going to be glad for it. And I'm not going to sit here and, and rent my clothes and pour dust on my head because a bunch of God is judging some wicked country. <clears throat> Look at Psalms 58, verse 10. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. Well, boy, that sounds, that sounds kind of harsh. Well, keep reading. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. That's pretty intense. <laughs> I'm not just going to shout about it. I'm going to go wash my feet in their blood. Ah, That's what they get. Bunch of murderous, oppressive scum of the earth. Bunch of wicked, God-hating people. I'm glad they're dead. I'm glad this country is going to get what it's got coming. I'm not going to sit here and bemoan it. I'm going to rejoice. <clears throat> You know, Phineas' wife, if you go back to our story, she has a similar reaction. And she's married to this reprobate, Phineas, which is what exactly what he was, was a reprobate. <laughs> and when he dies, she has a similar reaction as her father-in-law, Eli. It says in verse 19, And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, and her pains come upon her. So she gets all this bad news, and she goes into an early labor. Now, she was near, right? But this induced, the stress of this news just induces her into going into labor. And it says in verse 20, And about the time of her death, the woman that stood, women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, thou wast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, the glory is departed from Israel because the ark was taken and because her father-in-law and her husband. Look, she's naming this kid because the ark of God is taken. She's upset that the glory of God has departed from Israel. Yes, it's part of, yes, she's got, you know, it wasn't just all that. There's the little bit there, oh, and her husband and, and, and her, and her father-in-law. But you know what really got to her was the fact that the glory of God departed. That was her parting words. Verse 22, and she said, the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. That's what really bothered her about that whole situation. <clears throat> and that's what I kind of wonder about us tonight. Are we upset when God is judging this, and God is judging this country? Are we upset about it? And when God really starts with this country, are we going to get upset with God? Are we going to just, are we going to sit back and just be like, oh no, you know, my money or... Uh, uh, it's just so inconvenient, you know, and, and this and that and whatever, and just bemoan all the circumstances? Or are we going to be more upset about the fact that God has to judge this country? You know what should upset us is that the glory of God has departed from this, this country. And we should just say, well, you know what? Then we deserve what we got coming. And if what we got coming means the wicked are going to perish, then I'm all for it. It's, you know, it's something we have to think about. And honestly, we have to really give it some thought because the way things are going, we very well may see, you know, and we already have begun to see, but we, haven't really see, we don't know what's coming. We don't know what, I mean, 2020, who knows what's next? I mean, it's COVID, <laughs> it's riots. I mean, what's, what's next? Are they going to like some Jurassic Park stuff? Or I don't know, like, are they going to, someone's going to turn loose some, dinosaurs with laser beams and machine guns I, who knows you know but god's gonna judge i know that because this country's got it coming so you decide what you want to get upset about you go ahead and you decide what you want to lament i'm not saying you're not going to be upset about something but i'm not going to sit here and be sad about god judging a wicked country i'm going to be sorry that that god has to do that that it's come to that that's what should bother us not that the country is being judged, but that God has to. And say, you know what? It's too bad that we had that. Because like Israel, we had it pretty good. We started out. It didn't have to go this way, folks. But that's the nature of man. That's what happens. Man has fallen. And, and uh, you know, when the, wicked, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. It's just a natural consequence of what happens when, when a nation gets sinful and wicked like ours. 
So that's what you have to ask yourself tonight. You know, how, what's really bothering you about this judgment that we're seeing, you know, and that we're going to see? You know, is it, is it the suffering and all that? And I understand that it's troubling. Or is it the fact that God has to judge it all? Let's go ahead and pray.